Hello, everyone. I am Hussein, and this is News Distillate, your go-to destination for daily news updates, where we will provide you with the news you care about in a concise and efficient manner. And now, let's get started with our first news with my co-host, Emma. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Hussein. I'm Emma, and I'm here to bring you the latest news. Five people are going on trial in Germany today for a very serious crime. They were accused of planning a far-right coup and trying to kidnap the country's health minister. The group, called United Patriots, wanted to create a situation similar to a civil war. They planned to use explosives to cause blackouts and then kidnap the health minister. Thankfully, they were arrested before they could do anything. Police found 22 guns, including a Kalashnikov rifle and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. They also found large amounts of cash, gold and silver. One of the suspects, a 75-year-old woman, wrote letters to the presidents of Russia and Poland. The health minister, Karl Lauterbach, hopes for a fair verdict that will make sure no one else tries to do something like this. That's all the news for tonight, Hussein. What do you have for us? Oh, today we have some interesting news. The Federal Appeals Court is hearing arguments on a case that could potentially make abortion illegal. This case is about a medication called Pristone, which is used for abortion and miscarriage treatment. It's a high-stakes lawsuit that could affect the access to this medication nationwide. The hearing was held at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. It was a panel of three conservative judges appointed by Republican presidents. The Department of Justice and Danko Laboratories, the drug maker behind Mifepristone, were defending the drug. The abortion rights opponents argued that the FDA should never have approved this medication more than 20 years ago and also shouldn't have expanded access to the drug in 2016. They also argued that the FDA's changes made the drug more available and caused more problems. The judges asked tough questions to both sides. They asked the Department of Justice and Danko Laboratories about the safety of the drug and the plaintiff's attorney about whether the ER doctors who brought this case and oppose abortion were harmed by the fact that FDA approved this medication. It's important to note that Mifepristone is never or almost never used alone. It's used as the first medication in a two-drug regimen with misoprostol. This was barely discussed in the hearing, which was a surprise. The Supreme Court has put a hold on any changes to access to Mifepristone for a good long while. So it's currently legal and available right now. Most court watchers expect a ruling from these judges in the coming weeks or months. It will almost certainly be appealed to the Supreme Court, which may hear arguments in the fall and issue a decision in the spring. So, that's the latest on the Federal Appeals Court hearing on Mifepristone. It's a high-stakes case that could potentially make abortion illegal, and it's important to stay informed on the latest developments. Back to you, Emma. Thank you, Hussein. It's time to talk about two major decisions that will have lasting impacts on the world. First, the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling on Mifepristone, which could have a major impact on the abortion rights of women across the U.S. And second, the EU's new emissions policy, which could have a global impact on climate pollution. The EU is trying to get companies around the world to cut their climate pollution by putting a price on emissions from certain imports, like steel and aluminum. This is called a carbon border adjustment mechanism, and it's designed to make sure that companies in the EU aren't at a disadvantage compared to manufacturers that can emit carbon dioxide for free. So how does this work? Basically, the fewer emissions that countries and companies emit when they're making goods, the less they'll pay in taxes when they sell to EU customers. The EU won't be taxing everything it imports, just certain goods like iron, steel, cement, aluminum, fertilizers, electricity, and hydrogen. The idea is that countries like China that burn a lot of coal to run their factories could be persuaded to cut emissions so their companies aren't boxed out of the EU market. Meanwhile, countries like the U.S., which already have fairly strict environmental regulations, might also begin taxing the emissions linked to imports in order to protect their own domestic industries. In the U.S., Democrats and Republicans in Congress have begun talking seriously about what a similar policy in the U.S. might look like. But it's important to note that this isn't just about cutting emissions, it's also about protecting U.S. businesses. A carbon border adjustment mechanism could help level the playing field by making sure that companies in the U.S. don't have to compete with companies in countries with weaker environmental regulations. However, some worry that if countries focus too much on protecting domestic industries, it could actually hurt global efforts to cut emissions. That's why it's important for countries to work together to make sure that everyone is doing their part to reduce climate pollution. So will this work? It's hard to say. A lot will depend on how countries and companies outside of the EU respond. But if other big economies start setting their own carbon border taxes or joining together in clubs to impose levies across borders, it could create a powerful incentive to cut emissions on a global scale. In the end, it's up to us to make sure that we're doing our part to reduce climate pollution. 
We can all do our part by making sure that we're using energy efficiently, reducing our waste, and supporting policies that will help reduce emissions. Let's make sure that we're doing our part to protect our planet for future generations. Emma, that was a great overview of the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism. I'm curious, what do you think the global impact of this policy could be? Well, it could be a powerful incentive for countries to reduce their emissions. But it's important to remember that we all have to do our part to reduce climate pollution. We can all do our part by using energy efficiently, reducing our waste, and supporting policies that will help reduce emissions. OK, then, what's our next news, Hussein? Thanks, Emma. At-home DNA test kits can tell you a lot about your ancestry and identity, but they can't accurately tell race and ethnicity. That's because race isn't determined by biology, but by racism. It's a long history that has been used to oppress people and deny them access to resources. So, while DNA tests can tell you about your family tree, they can't tell you your race. That's because race is a social construct, not a scientific one. It's a way of categorizing people based on physical characteristics, but it doesn't tell us anything about our genetic makeup. Instead, it's important to look at our history and understand how racism has shaped our society. We need to recognize that race is a social construct, not a scientific one. We also need to recognize that racism is still a major issue in our society and that we need to work together to combat it. At-home DNA test kits can be a great way to learn more about our ancestry and identity, but they can't tell us our race. We need to look at our history and understand how racism has shaped our society in order to truly understand our identity. So if you're looking to learn more about your ancestry and identity, consider an at-home DNA test kit. Just remember that it can't tell you your race. That's something that only you can decide. That's a great point, Hussein. So what you're saying is that DNA test kits can tell us a lot about our ancestry and identity, but they can't tell us our race. Our That's right, Emma. Race is a social construct, not a scientific one. We need to look at our history and understand how racism has shaped our society in order to truly understand our identity. Absolutely. So if you're looking to learn more about your ancestry and identity, consider an at-home DNA test kit. Just remember that it can't tell you your race. Right. That's something that only you can decide. OK, then. What's our next news, Emma? Thank you, Hussein. It's time to talk about the importance of staying connected to our Google accounts. Google recently announced that if you haven't logged into your account in over two years, it will be deleted. That means all of your data stored in Gmail, Google Drive and Docs, Google Photos, Google Calendar and YouTube will be gone. But don't worry, Google will send several notices to inactive accounts and to recovery emails associated with those accounts before they delete it. Google is doing this to protect our data. They said neglected accounts are more likely to use old or repeated passwords and less likely to have two-step authentication enabled and to do security checks on the account. That means these accounts are more vulnerable to being hacked and used for identity theft or malicious content. So if you haven't logged into your Google account in a while, make sure you do it soon. All you have to do is log in, which includes logins to third-party websites and apps. That's all it takes to keep your account active and your data safe. At the end of the day, it's important to remember that our data is valuable and needs to be protected. So make sure to keep your accounts secure and up to date. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you tomorrow.